walked right next to us, but we couldn't see him. Can you believe it? He was actually the one that we were looking for and hoping for, but we couldn't see him. We thought he came to redeem us from Rome, but we were so wrong. He didn't meet our expectations because our expectations were too small. We could not see him because our hurt, because of our pain, had blinded us. The doubt, the disappointment, the discouragement was too much for us to bear. But the one walking with us began to help us see. He opened the scriptures and taught us and revealed that he was the one who bought us. We invited the stranger into our home and our hearts began to burn within. He took bread and blessed it. We were blessed because finally we could see the resurrected blessed one. He's the one that rose from the dead. And right in that moment, even though he disappeared from our sight, we could finally see him more clearly. Our guest prices are high, but 
Purses are cool, right, ladies, right? Um, and bags and stuff. So they'll be bringing some of that stuff. But Cecilia will be here with us. And then one other thing I want to tell you that you did this week, church, you didn't even know it. You're so good. Um, um, there is a new project that is Dave Ramsey. And what they've done is they've come up with a project to sponsor schools to bring his curriculum into public schools. How cool is that, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? You sponsored. And so both Leesburg High School and Oak Park are going to have the Dave Ramsey curriculum in their schools to be used, right? How amazing is that? Again, because of what you're doing. So thank you what you do. A couple other quick announcements. Don't forget, small groups have just started. Still time for you to get into a small group. Get onto our website. Under Connect, hit small groups. They're all listed for you there. We'd really love for you to do that. Next week, does anybody know what next week is? What is it? What is it? Don't be late. Don't be late because you forgot to set the clock back. Right? Don't forget. Next week is the daylight savings time. And parents, because you lose an hour and it makes it harder with the kids, don't forget, it's Pajama Sunday. You can bring them in their pajamas. Right? So you don't have to worry about all this stuff. I mean, I would suggest you still brush your teeth. Come on, y'all. And nobody wants their driving back here, but you can at least keep them in their pajamas, okay? So next week is daylight savings time. And then I'm really excited that we're doing it again this year. We are going to adopt the Leesburg High School staff, all right? So here's the deal. Uh, starting March 21st, we'll have eight weeks till the end of school. And there are 150 staff members between administrators, teachers, lunch ladies, school resource officers, the whole staff. We have the whole list. If you would like to adopt one member of the Leesburg High School staff, we need to know that. So, yeah, you can put that on one of those connect cards that we have there in the experience guide. Put your name in there. And let us know, I want to, I want to elect just staff member, I want to adopt a staff member, and we will uh, specifically give you a name, and then your responsibility is, one, to write them a note at the beginning, to introduce yourself and tell them that you're praying for them every day till the end of the school year, and then if you want to, you can do things along the way in between, but at the end, we'll probably send them a note at the end again. So, we're going to be adopting them over the next couple weeks, I'll be reminding you, but we need 150 of you to sign up so that we can adopt. As a matter of fact, we're really excited we have a, a brand new elected like staff member who's at church with us this morning. I just met her in the hallway over there. So really, really excited uh, for this opportunity. So put that on the connect card. I'll pull that out of your screen, Scott. Put your name on it. Let us know that you want to adopt somebody. Okay. We are jumping into a brand new series that I have been very excited about for a couple months now, uh, thinking about it. And this series is just simply called Seeing Jesus Changes Everything. And here's what I mean by that. Seeing, you know, well, here's what I would say, seeing which Jesus. Because how many of you know you can get about 1,400 different answers of who Jesus was or is, right? What, what he did or didn't do, limitation, whatever. And so what I really thought is as we lead up towards Easter, what would it be like for us to dive into some biblical concepts that we can really sink our teeth into about who Jesus is? So I almost made the title Seeing Jesus Really seeing Jesus changes everything, right? The idea that there may be some of us, as a matter of fact, in a crowd that's large, I would guarantee it, that there are some of us here that we have actually a little bit twisted views of who Jesus is. Uh, because our Uncle Joe said blah, blah, blah. Because our Sunday school teacher in a different denomination said blah, blah, blah. Because whatever type of scenarios I've seen on TV, I read the Time Magazine article, because Time Magazine has got Jesus nailed, y'all. And I hope you have a laugh. Some of you are like, yeah, no, 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 no. But I, my point is, is the only thing that we can know about Jesus is what we know from his word, you know? Right? And so we want to dive into his word over the next several weeks and, and, and see who is who's Jesus. What does he look like? So I want to open with this from First Corinthians. Paul wrote these words, and I think they're great for us to start with. First Corinthians 2, 1 says this. If so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquent or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. All right? So I'll say this to you if you're near the church. Um, if you thought you were going to come and have some amazingly eloquent speaker, <laughs> I was born in Mississippi, y'all. I got to have my fellows from Louisiana. What that means is you may not learn anything, but we're going to have some fun today. You know what I'm saying? But that's kind of what Paul says, right? It's, it's, I didn't come with eloquent human speech, or right? it's, it's, it's not about that. For I resolved to know nothing 
while I was with you, except Jesus Christ. We want to see Jesus for who he really is. Right? Nothing but who Jesus is. And him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now, that's what I believe in this morning. I don't care where you were born or what your IQ is. I mean, you know, nothing is nothing unless Jesus shows up and demonstrates something into your hearts today. Right? It demonstrates his power in the process of what it is. And, and, and he's already going to do that. Did you feel his presence in worship? Did you feel his presence in the time that but he wants to, to, to do something that's a demonstration of his power in his own So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom. Right? On God's power. My faith has to rest on something more than debate, debated arguments. Come on. Anybody watch? You ever watch debates? You ever watch that kind of stuff? You ever watch apologetics? People go back and forth about what it doesn't say and it does say and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, there's a place for that, for us to have conversation, nice conversation, loving conversation. But that's really not what it's all about. It's about knowing Him. How can you be sure of what you don't see? Because that's what faith is. Faith is being sure of what you do not see. How how can you be sure of what you do not see? Well, here's the answer. You test it. You test it. Right? You actually put into practice or into play something, and you see whether or not it works. Very few of you guys came in and took your seat today and went, you didn't tell you this block now. Right? I mean, what if you had gone to the floor? You'd have been shot. Oh my gosh. But you didn't test it. And here's what I would say to you today. I really believe that's true about the way we approach God. We, you, you can't intellectualize yourself to faith. You, you can't get enough intellectual arguments to get yourself to this place of true faith, of, of being passionate about who Jesus is. It requires that we understand who Jesus is and then put into action something. Why is it we stand in church and sing or say that God has it all under control, but when but on Wednesday when all heaven broke loose, we can't? See, there's the test. The test is out here. The test is when the storm comes. How many of you know there's probably a storm coming this week? You know, like, that's why I didn't come to church for that. I came to church for you to encourage me. Right? Let me encourage you. There's going to be a storm this week. Can I encourage you with that? And why would I encourage you with that? Because it's a chance for you to practice your faith. That's why it should be encouraging to that whole point. When storms come, we doubt, we worry, we question. So I've got a, a story that you, some of you have been in church long enough. You, you, you've heard the story. But I'm going to dive into the story a little bit. To give us an idea of what it looks like for us day to day. You guys know, I like practical, right? Like, like I can get into Greek and we can do all that kind of stuff. But I want to know what to do tomorrow. Anybody else? I want to know what to do on Tuesday afternoon when everything in my house goes just haywire. When my kids have lost their mind. When my boys have lost their mind. When my coworkers have lost their mind. Right? When, when people in other countries have lost their mind. I almost said something, but I don't leave that alone. But anyway. So let me give you a story, but I want to do it this way. I'm going to give it to you out of two different Gospels. For those of you who don't know, there are four books in the Bible called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four Gospels are about the same time period, so they have repeating stories. So some of the stories are in all four, or in two, or in three, or one. But um, but they're different versions from different personalities and perspectives. So I want to give you the same story, but I want to read the first part from one Gospel and the second part from another Gospel. So let me start out with Mark 4. 35, here's a story. True story, not a parable. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, this is Jesus talking, he says to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. I want to stop right there and emphasize something. Did Jesus just say that we're going to do something? What? What did he just say that we're going to do? We're going to go to the other side. When Jesus says something's going to happen, do you think it happens? That's what a giant is wrong. We're going to come back to that in a second. Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took, uh, took him along, just as he was in the boat. 
There are also other boats with him. A furious squall. How many of you have ever been in a storm on a boat? That's some scary stuff, though. Right? I've been in some crazy storms in boats. Um, I don't know what happened. We were on a pontoon boat on Lake Harris, and I had the girls in 10. And here we came across back to uh, to Leesburg, to, to uh, the marina here. And then you could just see the wall. Right? Like, here it comes. And so I looked at the radar, and it looked like it was going to go to our right. So I started headed left. I were in a pontoon boat, and, and I swear I must have had a five horsepower motor running. You know what I'm talking about? And so I was like, well, if we go left, maybe this thing's going to move past us here. But the more I watched the radar, how many of y'all know the more it expanded to the left? So finally, I'm looking at that, and we're like, you know, moving at this thing. And finally, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to the right. I'm going to go right around this thing. So we started heading over towards the shore. Well, can I tell you, we got to the point where we were from here to that wall to the shore, and it hit us. And it's blowing us towards the shore. I'm standing in the middle of the pontoon boat, holding one side of the boat and holding the steering wheel like this. The girls are in the floor with the towels over their head because it's like beatings coming out, you know what I mean? And we did that for about 15 minutes. And the whole time we're in, I mean, how do you let that 15 minutes for like three hours? Right? Here is squall. I just want to give you a picture of what's going on here. A very squall came up. And the waves broke over the boat. Some of you feel that way today. So that it was nearly swamped. Some of you feel that way today, that your boat feels a little bit swamped right now. With the struggles and the things that are going on in your home and your family and your community. So as Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, I want to be like Jesus and sleep more on boats. Anybody else? Right? That's, that's God like to sleep on a boat. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, here it comes. <laughs> Come on, dude, do you even give a flip about us? That's their reaction. Hello? Yo, Savior of the world. Hello? Right? Okay. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now let me flip over to Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to pick it up from there. Verse 26. He replied, O oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Let me ask you a question. What did Jesus tell them they were going to do? How many of us, we've gotten a word from God, storm comes, we forget the word of God. We forget the, the promise that he's given. We forget the faithfulness of our God, right? And he, and, and he said, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Here's the sentence. Here's what. Here's the way I. You ever thought you knew somebody? Then they did something and you thought, maybe I don't really know them. That's kind of, right? That's kind of what's going on here. Is that like we thought we knew Jesus? We did. We bros. We hung out. Like I did. And then what? What, what, what is this? Or what, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Man, the storms of life have a way of revealing a different understanding of who Jesus is. I wonder if the disciples were looking at him at the moment as a great teacher. And you might say, what do you mean by that? Well, well, the three chapters in Matthew prior to this um, were all teachings. He was standing in front of people and he was, he, was, he was teaching. And so they got one mindset of who he was. Like you see in Matthew, he goes through the three chapters before him. He had the Beatitudes and all these parables, a lot of parables that we know. Uh, there was, and, and, and he's teaching, what kind of man is this? They were having their eyes open to who Jesus really is, not what they had decided he was. Some of us have decided that we know who Jesus is. And what he'd like to do this morning is expand your understanding of who he is. Open your eyes up to a different concept of who he is. Not what they had decided he was, not what they had heard he was. They were seeing another aspect. Really seeing Jesus for who he is, not what you think. Come on. What somebody told you, what scrambled message you picked up at a different church with a different type of teaching. But really seeing Jesus, listen to me, church, changes everything. 
But what I want to say to you is, who is he in this story? When we're trying to grab, who is Jesus? We're trying to see him or, or understand him a little bit. Different. Who is he in this story? Well, let's break the story down a little bit. Because what I want to say to you first is maybe you did or maybe you didn't recognize that there are actually three storms in the story. You see the three storms in the story? Here's one. One is the obvious one. It's the physical storm. The squalls and wind and the chaos that's going around, right? That's the physical storms. How many of you know we're going through physical storms right now? Are we going into World War III? We don't know. Right? And the gas prices are going to go through the roof. If this bill goes through the house and wants to say no no oil from Russia anymore, and now we go up another two, three dollars a gallon, how's that sound? Right? <laughs> Jen and I just booked a trip for Jasmine for her graduation, and we decided to go on an RV trip. It's going to be about $40,000 for gas. <laughs> but these are the physical storms that are around us that we see. Maybe you're dealing with medical issues. Maybe you're, but these, this is, these, those are the obvious ones. The other two storms are not always so obvious unless you're really paying attention. The second storm is that it says that the disciples begin to what? Panic. Freak out. In other words, there was an emotional storm. How many of you know whenever you see physical storms around you, the next thing that happens is an emotional storm within you? And depending on our emotional IQ or our emotional health, it might be a crazy storm, it might be just a simple mist. But it has everything to do with the health of our emotional self. Can I recognize why I'm feeling this way and what I'm doing? I think it was Friday. Friday? Anybody else do this? Like, I talk about this stuff, and then y'all judge me, but that's okay. Um, Friday, all of a sudden, I just was not happy with Jim. She didn't say anything right. She didn't do anything right. No, I didn't say anything to her, but on the inside, I was just kind of going, go away. Do you know what I'm talking about, or is it just me? Where... All of a sudden you find yourself in a mood. Come on, anybody ever just get in a mood? You're like, what is wrong with me? Listen to me, there is where emotional intelligence comes in. Do I have the ability to stop and recognize what is the emotion? What is it that's bothering me? What is it that, that inside of me I'm struggling with and it's causing this chaos inside of me? Now, if you don't address the emotional storm, you get the third storm. The third storm, what did they do? They looked at Jesus and went, Don't you even care about us? It's a spiritual storm. See, the physical storms of life will lead to emotional storms and struggles inside of us. And if we are not healthy with the emotional storms inside of us, we will get to the place of a spiritual storm. What does that look like? I doubt you, God. I question you, God. Right? There's, there's a storm that happens inside of us that leads to a place that is so unhealthy. How often do we relate to these physical storms causing emotional storms, leading to spiritual storms? And Jesus said, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. Can I remind, can I remind you of this this morning? You and I. We're going to the other side, y'all. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? I don't care what's going on. I don't care what happened this week. I mean, I do care. But you know what I'm saying. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're going to the other side. If you know Jesus, we just reviewed his benefit package. Right? We're going to the other side, and we've got to hold on to that. Now, it's not a physical storm that we have or are going to face in this life that we are not going to get to the other side. That's a promise of our God. How do I know this? Okay, let me show you. Romans 8 and 28. And we know all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to already go to the other side. So it says, Mike's version, right? To be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He justified. And those He justified, 
He glorified. That's an amen moment. I will amen myself. I mean, what I'm saying to you, like, you've been justified, so you've been glorified. Guess what? You're going to go to the other side. Had this thought. Isn't that story? Maybe the miracle wasn't the storm that was caused, calmed on the outside. It was the one that was called on the inside. Can I say to you this morning, Jesus is much more concerned about the storm on the inside of you than he is on the outside of you. He's more concerned with how you respond to, how you react to, and what he's trying to do in that whole process. I've said it a million times, I'll say it again. God really is not interested in your comfort. He's interested in you, your character. He's developing something inside of you, but it takes faith. The reason we come together as a church so we can high five somebody and remind people of their benefit package and go keep going. You got this. Why? Because Jesus said we are going to the other side. Amen? Absolutely. Absolutely. So who is Jesus in the story? Well, the Bible would use an illustration like this. He is the anchor for your soul. He's the anchor in the storm. He is the anchor for your soul. Let me show it to you in Hebrews 6 and 9. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Let me say it again. You're going to get to the other side. You're going to get to the other side. Okay, Pastor. I hear you. And that's all like good church hype. Hey Amen. I don't know you're aware of Now i got to go out there and deal with them people. How many know people stink? How many know there's some crazy people at your workplace? If you can't think of any crazy people at your workplace, guess what? It's you. I want to be calm, Pastor, in the storms, but I seem to freak out. Anybody? I want to, like, chill out in the storms, but well, I don't know what comes over me. I just lose my mind. Anybody? I still doubt God, or I question whether or not he's paying attention. So how, how do I practically do this? And I would say it to you this way. You have to stay tied to the anchor. You have to stay tied to the anchor. Sam and I are out scalloping last year during scalloping season. And for those of you who don't know how to scallop, you get in like three to six foot of water. You put the anchor outside your boat and put on snorkel gear. You snorkel around and it's like a, it's like an Easter egg hunt. Right? You find them, you grab them, put them in your bag. So Jim and I are out snorkeling, both of us off the boat, throwing the two of us that day. We're doing our thing and I bring my head up <laughs> and the boat is like a football field away. And I'm like, uh, can I carry us? And now Jim's swimming around right here. I'm swimming around here. She's like, hey, right? And I panicked for a second. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And then I realized I did something brilliant. Don't judge me. I threw the anchor out. I just didn't tie the rope to the boat. Don't judge me like you ain't never done something like that. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want notes. I don't want texts. Don't send me gifts. I know y'all. It's all coming. I don't want to hear about it. I'm just telling you a story because Jesus is trying to talk to you today, okay? I swear I'm like a beast. <laughs> I went for that. We were in like four foot of water, so I'm like, you know, got the dog, ride right it back, and I had to snuffle around. Oh, <laughs> there's the Right. Anyway, sorry to the boat. Here's my point. Here's my point. Listen to me. I wonder how many Christians have an anchor in their boat. But if they're really honest, it's not tied to their boat. You want the anchor to work when you want it to work. But you don't want the anchor to limit you so you don't tie it to the boat. Come on now, that would get serious. I had to make you laugh because I was going to come at you a little bit, right? Because what happens when you tie an anchor in the boat, throw it out, it limits the movement of the boat. That's where obedience comes in. Right? That's where doing it God's way comes in. And when we don't, and the boat looks floating off, 
Right? Come on, y'all. But we don't have to go through that kind of stuff because we've been so blessed. But what if? What if? Would we be so bold because we cultivated such a relationship that our God has spent time with him? He's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the valley snare, from the deadly pestilence. Oh, oh, come on now. Any diseases going around? Any pestilence going on in our world? Surely he will save you from the pestilence. Come on, don't live fear. Guess what? Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Remember? Right? It's the thing in promise. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wing. He will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. So I sent you a playlist. If you didn't get it, we don't get a card. We'll send it to you. It's all worship songs that our worship team has done over the last several months. But I want to challenge you this week. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes, whatever. Would you take time in worship? Would you take time and cultivate this presence? Here's why. Peace is not the absence of trouble. It's the presence of God. Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have problems. How many of you know? You're either coming out of a storm, in a storm, or headed into one. Right? The more fast, the positive, the faster. The positive, come on. You're headed. <laughs> you're coming out of your hand, or you're headed into That is life. Peace is not the absence of that. Peace is the presence of God cultivated in our hearts. Second thing we can do. We're anchored when we remember God's promises. What did Jesus tell them? We're going to the other side, right? Whenever you do what God said, it's like a man who built his house upon the rock. That's what the scripture tells us. What does that mean? You're solid. When you, when you bank on God's promises, you're solid. No matter what's shaking around you, you will not be shaken. Psalm 119 and 81. My soul faints with longing for your salvation. That's the first part. How many of you know? Maybe you don't know this. When you read the Psalms, all the Psalm songs start out whining. Oh, that's so terrible, man. People coming after me, man. I don't feel so good. At the end of every one of them, bless the Lord, oh my soul, that all it is that was in me. Well, don't read them, and you'll see. Yeah, listen, there's only one verse. My soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. What you have said is true. If you watch too much of the news, you're going to go crazy. I don't care which news you watch. Right? Everybody's got an agenda. Your soul will get out of balance. So I'm going to, I thought, how can I challenge you? Here's my challenge for you. For every hour of news you watch, I'd like you to balance it with an hour in God's Word. We've got to cultivate the presence of God. We've got to stir our faith back to understanding. We've got to drive ourselves to the anchor. Right? Because, come on, y'all. You know, if we can go through what's been going on in our country, are you following what, what Trump says and Biden says? Are you a Fauci? Are you anti Fauci? Are you, I mean, come on, this is what's going on in our world right now. And what that's all about is what do you tie your anchor to? And what I'm telling you this morning is please tie your anchor to the only anchor that holds, the only anchor that is secure and solid, and that is Jesus. So it's going to do this way. Don't let your circumstances speak louder than God's word. Don't let your circumstances speak louder than God's word. Here's number three. I'm going to close. We're anchored when we understand God's process. God's process. If the disciples would have remembered that he said that they were going to the other side, they may have reacted differently. If they had remembered that promise... They may have reacted differently. So before Jesus speaks to the storm, God says, He speaks to the disciples. Before He says, Come down from Him, He looks at them and goes, You have a little faith, what's the deal? Some of you listen to me. God hasn't spoken to your storm yet because He's trying to speak to you. You keep going, Jesus, don't you see that? Don't you see that, Jesus? Don't you see that mountain? Don't you see that mess? And He's not, I see the mess. I, I want to talk with you first. I want to deal with you first. I want to deal with your faith in this process. Maybe you 
just wants to remind you today that you're going to the other side. Romans 5 and 2. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Come on, y'all. You know what that says? We're going to the other side. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. What? What? No, I don't like it. I don't like pain. Pain hurts. See? Why would we rejoice in our sufferings? Because that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Ooh, listen to me, trouble doesn't always build character, but it does always reveal it. The way we respond, the size of our emotional storm has a lot to do with the character that we have or have not established by being anchored to the only one who brings firmness and security to our lives. The current struggles of this world are revealing character. You understand that? How we respond to what's going on in the world around us is revealing character. How other people are responding it is revealing character. It is revealing what we are anchored to. And many people who have trusted in their bank accounts now are feeling a little shaky. And those who put a whole big trust in a certain party or government now are feeling a little shaky. Remember, there are some that have put all their trust in the medical field. Now we're just going to be trust. Could it be? Listen, church, this is so cool. This is good news. I don't even think of all this crazy stuff. Listen to this. This is good news. Could it be that our God in his infinite wisdom is jacking up everything so we'll stop trusting in it? So we would turn our eyes back to the only one that we are to trust. So we would go and I'm going to trust in men and bank accounts and all this sort of stuff. I trust you, God. Why? Because you told me we're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. One of the things I like to do sometimes is, is uh, get on my smoker and smoke some meat. Like a big Boston butt or something, right? Come on, guys. Come on. Give me a grunt or something. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Anybody who's ever cooked anything on meat on a grill or anything, how many of you know you can take it off too early? You ever taken it off too early? And you're staring at it like, is it ready or is it not ready? Well, what do you have to do? You have to test it. Now, if you're smart, I'm talking about, if you're smart, you got one of the temperature gauges. And you can temperature gauge it. But if you're not smart, if you're not ready, you got to cut it open. And when you cut it open and it moves, it's not ready. Or oinks or whatever, right? But when you cut it open and you realize it's not ready, what do you do? You put it back on the fire. Is that not what God does with us sometimes? Our character is not quite ready. We need a little bit more of the fire. Is the fire a bad thing? It feels like a bad thing. It's hot and it's a painful. But is it that something that God is dealing with? Understanding God's process. God is developing something in you. Think of the worst scenario that you're in right now. And I'm hoping this morning to switch your mindset on That God is not punishing you, but maybe it is that God is refraining you. He's developing something in you. And the sooner you participate, guess what? The sooner you get off fire. Right? We cultivate by understanding God's process. Cultivate his presence, remember his promises, trust his promises. Storms are coming and going, and they're going to happen from now till Jesus comes back. It's up to each one of us that as we cultivate these things in our heart and in our lives, we're going to have emotional storms, but maybe not so much that they get the spiritual storms. Are you all here? I'm to you this morning. So what about you? What did God say to you this morning? This, like what, what, what particular thing did he put his finger on in you? Some of you may have never given your heart to Jesus, and you've heard it differently today, and you go, hey, for the first time, I'm going to surrender my life to God today. You do that, but we pray in just a moment. For some of you, you recognize, I've been anchored to some things I shouldn't be anchored to. I've been counting on things that, that, that I hold on to, and that's my security blanket in this process. And God's sort of shaking that up and reminding me that's true. And then for others of us, we've been many of you have walked with Jesus for years and years and years. 
And you've just gotten away from it because you're just kind of doing the rote traditional religion thing. Instead of cultivating the relationship. Instead of reading your word that way. What is it? What is it that God would want you to do today? How would the Holy Spirit have you this morning? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word today and the challenge that you give us. Now, Holy Spirit, what do you want us to do? And that answer is different for each and every one of us. What is it that you called us to? What change do we need to make? What thought process do we need to consider? How, how do I cultivate your, your presence in my life? And I need to focus on cultivating your presence here. Some of us just need to remember his promises as well. Others need to remember you are in that place because he is refining you. And you are right in the center of his will as he develops your character. I thank you for speaking to us today. Now give us courage to respond. What do we do next? What is the next step for us in that process? And if any of you, the next step was to begin a relationship with Jesus, only give us some words. Nothing magical about my words. What's magical is the sincerity of your heart. Something like this. Jesus, today I surrender. I give you my heart. I give you my all. I don't understand it all, but I, I sense you calling me today. I thank you that you love me, even in the mess that I'm in, even with all my stuff. Today, I surrender my heart. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. As best as I can understand, I'm going to try to serve you from now until the end of my life. God, we thank you for what you're doing today and the work you're doing. We pray in Jesus' name that all God's people said. And then, and then in just a second, the team's going to close in, in worship. And I will say this very often, but today's song, you really might want to hang around for just a moment and sing. The song is called Hope Has a Name. And for those of you who walked in here and you were waiting a little bit in your hope or your faith or you've been frustrated or things that are going on, you might just need to worship a little bit more and soak a little bit more in the truth of who Jesus is. Right? So when I say, when I say go in a minute, I'll let you go. You're welcome to leave. You're welcome to go get your kids. Life Step 1 starts today. For those of you who want to go through Life Steps, please come join me. I'd love to have you in Life Step 1 today and go through that process. But for others of you, you might want to hang for just a minute. Um, I called Oakwood this point of barbecue. All right? <laughs> Church will be brave. Be brave. What is it that God's calling you to do next? Now be brave and do it. Amen? Stay to your feet. Let's put us in worship. We'll see you guys next week.